Hi, Mrs. Brown here. Today we're finishing up our last unit, Social Psychology, um, and we're going to take a look at mods 76 through 80. So module 76 deals with group behavior. All right, so one thing we want to talk about is um, how other people being around influences our behavior. So one uh, concept that we know about is social facilitation. So social facilitation is uh, that we actually perform better when other people are around, all right? So in the presence of others, we may perform better. So you can think of this as, you know, facile is the Spanish word, easy. So it makes things easier when other people are around. Um, so this, this concept can be seen all the time. Maybe if you are a performer, you're a musician, and when you're just kind of doing things by yourself, uh, you might not have that energy, but as soon as you get in front of a crowd, it really elevates your performance. That would be an example of social facilitation. Or if you're an athlete and you feel like you play better when you have an audience watching you in your games, that would also be an example of social facilitation. So here you can see, um, you know, why does the home team have an advantage when you're playing sports? Well, we can see that, um, you know, they, the statistics say that that gives them uh, more likelihood to win, and it could be because of social facilitation. Now, one concept could be um, social inhibition. Social inhibition would be where you actually perform worse when there's people around and that could be because you're nervous or whatever. Um, so that is a possibility as well. But usually what we see is social facilitation. Another concept within group behavior is the concept of social loafing. And this is something that I talk about all year long. I say no social loafing, you know, don't be a social loafer. Um, because this is the idea that when you're working with a group, it is possible that the, the members of the group will try uh, less, will not work as hard because they feel like other people in the group are going to pick up the slack for them. Um, so the tendency of an individual in a group to exert less effort toward attaining a common goal than when tested individually. So if you've ever been in a group and you or somebody else in the group has just kind of sat back and said, oh, you know, my other group member will do this or, you know, you just kind of ride on the coattails of your group, that would be an example of social loafing. And so what we find is that when you are in a group, you might exert uh, less effort than when you are working individually. Um, when tug of war is going on, we actually pull harder when we're by ourselves than when we're pulling with a team of other people. So that's an example of social loafing. All right, another concept that influences behavior in the group setting is de-individuation. Um, and unfortunately, this is what we see sometimes in riots or mobs or protests that turn violent, is this loss of self-awareness and loss of self-restraint in group situations. Um, why? Because arousal and anonymity. So the idea that you're building off of the energy of other people and because there's a lot of people there or there's more you know, people than um, usual, you feel more anonymous, you feel less likely to be uh, noticed. And this can lead to this de-individuation where someone who might not usually um, you know, perform mob-like behavior or violent behavior suddenly could find themselves um, doing those things. So uh, this is something that you have to be careful about when you have these types of, um, you know, interest-charged events going on is this idea of de-individuation and what that can do to uh, people's ability to think things through and, um, you know, kind of creating some of that impulsive behavior. All right, another concept within group behavior is called group polarization. So typically when someone is kind of making a decision on their own, they may tend to have a more moderate point of view or you know, be able to, to see pros and cons, look at the whole situation. Something that can happen 
when um, a group comes together and is asked to make a decision is group polarization. This is the enhancement of a person's prevailing inclinations through discussion within a group. So someone may, you know, kind of have had an opinion that maybe wasn't very strong, but through the discussion within the group, it's actually caused them to polarize one way or another and become very, very strong with that opinion. Um, and it can have someone with certain tendencies to move toward extremism, especially when they have a grievance or there's some sort of um, experience or cause. So while they might have been more moderate or they might have been, you know, more likely to kind of be. Uh, less adamant about how they were feeling when they were alone, as soon as they get in this group, it sometimes can cause them to become very extreme with that opinion. And so this is something we want to think about because can this happen in, um, you know, groups that might be influential? So these online groups, you might see this where someone, you know, kind of had an opinion and then people started discussing something in the online group and it made their opinion very, very strong. Um, this is also something we need to be cautious about with terrorist organizations where, you know, if someone gets pulled into that kind of organization um, through that discussion, their, their uh beliefs can become very extreme and polarized. So this is just something uh, to think about. Um, if you ever find yourself in a group trying to discuss things and you find yourself becoming very, very, um, you know, pulled to one direction, it could be an example of group polarization. And that may be good or it might be, you know, you may need to take a step back from the group and kind of evaluate, is that actually how you feel? Almost conversely, another thing that can happen when groups are making decisions is the idea of groupthink. Um, the mode of thinking that occurs when the desire for harmony in decision making overrides realistic uh, appraisal of all the alternatives. So it may be that, you know, the group is just trying to make a consensus. People decide, you know, hey, I'm just going to go along with what the group says. I don't want to make any issues. Let's just let's just go ahead and, and move forward and agree. Well, what that can lead to is not looking at multiple perspectives, not thinking through everything clearly because the group just kind of decides to go with a certain decision uh, without questioning that because they just want to make peace and, and move on you know, with the choice. Uh, one example of this uh, that's been talked about before is the Challenger explosion. Um, you know, the spacecraft and how some, some groupthink went into some decision-making uh, factors with that um, with the Challenger, and that potentially led to some obviously very deadly issues with that spacecraft. All right, a couple of other things we want to talk about when we look at group behavior. So social norms, these are expected rules for behavior um, within that culture. So um, anything within the culture that, you know, people just kind of do, it's expected. It's almost like an unspoken uh, expected behavior. For example, in the United States, most people, when they yawn, they do cover their mouth. When they sneeze, they cover their mouth. Um, you know, sometimes you'll see certain things that, that people just do that's kind of a social norm. Um, and so that can influence how we behave with groups as well. Remember back to our cognitive psychology unit, we talked about schemas um, and we looked at Piaget. Uh, schemas are how we group or organize ideas about something. Um, so, you know, understanding that furry four-legged creatures, you know, we can group them into a schema of a dog or a cat or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so we do kind of have these expectations and these social schemas of how people are grouped together and how, you know, we think about the world. Um, and this does influence sometimes our behavior as well. So for example, we understand the schema for what a church is or what a funeral is or what school is. And we have certain expectations for how we would act and behave in within that schema. So we wouldn't behave the same way we would at church as we would at a bar or you know the way we would at our friend's house as we would at a funeral. So we have these ideas as to what um, 
you know, types of things and types of behavior go with our schema of that particular social situation. Um, we also have an understanding of grouping people um, in different categories. We may very quickly and maybe erroneously uh, group people into certain um, social groups just by looking at them or kind of drawing on some heuristics to make that decision. And that is all um, based on our social schema of what groups are like and what types of people fit into those groups. All right, moving into module 77, this module deals with prejudice and discrimination. So in particular, looking uh, at stereotypes and how stereotypes and prejudice can influence our behavior. So we wanna first make the distinction between these different words. So a stereotype is an overgeneralized idea about a group of people. Um, it may be based on like the representativeness heuristic or just you know our experiences with that group of people, our social schemas, whatever. Um, and sometimes stereotypes can lead us to make, you know, false, to lead us to false claims or, or things that, you know, are incorrect just based on uh, us drawing conclusions and using heuristics. Um, prejudice is an undeserved and usually negative attitude towards a group of people. Okay, so this could be, you know, towards uh, a particular racial group, it could be towards a particular age group, it could be towards a particular, you know, um, type of clique or um, an activity, a group of people who perform a certain activity. So there's lots of different types of prejudice, but usually this is an attitude um, and it's a negative attitude. All right, so um, for example, ethnocentrism, you know, being O only, uh, quote unquote, wanting to be around people that are the same ethnicity as you and just um, having prejudice against those that are a different ethnicity than you, that is an example of prejudice. Now, the difference between prejudice and discrimination is discrimination is an action. So someone can, can hold a prejudice and not discriminate. That is possible. Unlikely, but not that is possible. Um, but the discrimination is the actual action. So, you know, saying something or doing something or, you know, whatever is going on to act out that prejudice. That's the difference between those two. Um, discrimination is illegal, right? We have um, laws in the United States that prohibit discrimination. Um, that doesn't mean that people don't have prejudice. So people still have prejudice. Um, and, and discrimination does still occur, even though uh, there are some protections against uh, discrimination, it definitely does happen. Other things we wanna talk about, hindsight bias. We've come back to this throughout the year. Um, you know, I knew it all along. After learning the outcome, the tendency to believe you could have predicted it or known it. Um, and sometimes this can lead to blaming the victim and forming a prejudice. Um, so, you know, kind of looking at the outcome of a situation and stereotyping that, that outcome and saying, oh, I knew that was going to happen because of this particular stereotype. That is an example of hindsight bias, but that also is, is something that can be an example of prejudice. Other things that can strengthen prejudice um, and uh, potentially lead to confirmation bias are illusory correlations. So we talked about this at the beginning of the year where we look for things that have a relationship, but they don't actually have that relationship. So we think that there's a relationship between two variables, but it's not. So I said like, oh, you know, it always rains at Virginia Tech. Clearly this is not the case, but every time that I have visited Virginia Tech, it's been raining. So this is just an illusory correlation. I can't actually say that it only rains at Virginia Tech, right? Um, it's just that every time that I've been there. So this is an example of confirmation bias, and this is actually an illusory correlation because there's not a relationship between these two things. Um, now this can lead to confirming people's stereotypes. So, you know, I've never met an honest lawyer. You know, it may be that you have met some dishonest lawyers, but there are honest lawyers out there. So every time you meet a dishonest lawyer, you are, you know, this illusory correlation is just leading to confirmation bias. 
Another thing to be aware of is the stereotype effect or stereotype bias. Um, and this could be if someone does have a certain stereotype or an understanding um, about other people and they treat them that way, it can lead to a certain outcome. Or if you yourself, you know, someone has a stereotype against you and it leads you to kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy with that. Um, so the idea that we perform at the level of our stereotype if reminded of the stereotype. Um, so let's say you have a stereotype uh, about, you know, white people not being able to dance well. Um, and then when they're reminded of the stereotype, they actually dance worse. This would be an example of the stereotype effect or stereotype bias, right? Um, on a more serious note, one thing to think about is the influence of this on standardized testing and um, race. So one study that has been done is the effect of, you know, underperforming African-American students being reminded that they're underperforming and then continuing to be underperforming. Um, and that would be an example of the stereotype effect. Um, so that's something that they're studying and trying to understand, you know, how is this influencing the way things are being taught and, and why is this the case? And um, trying to counteract the stereotype effect and stereotype bias and testing bias. All right, another um, thing to think about within this is the just world phenomenon. Um, and the way you think of this is like the world is just. Um, just traditionally has meant like fair, um, you know, all is right. Uh, what goes around comes around. It's just, like justice, okay? Um, and so the just world phenomenon is the tendency for people to believe that the world is just and people get what they deserve and deserve what they get. So this is just a fancy way <laughs> of saying karma. If you've ever uh, heard of the term karma, uh, what goes around comes around. So sometimes we will, you know, treat per people a certain way uh, because we think that they deserve to be treated that way. And that influences the outcome of, um, you know, behavior. Or uh, it could be that we treat people uh, you know, differently or something bad happens to someone and we say, oh, well, they deserve that. Uh, that's just an example of the just world phenomenon. So we need to be careful about this because this impacts how we think about other people uh, and could potentially lead to um, discrimination. All right, so some of these social roots of prejudice, we need to think about in-groups versus out-groups. These terms love to show up on FRQ. So the in-group is the us and the out-group is the them. So we will identify with people who are similar to us. It could be, you know, how we look, but it also could be like similar interests, similar um, activities. So you may be on a sports team and your in-group is your lacrosse team. You may, you know, be a teacher and your in-group is teachers. You may be, um, you know, it could be a certain, a certain race. So you, you know, your group of friends, if you are Asian, you may have an Asian group of friends, etc. So there's lots of different ways that we can define our in-group based on interest, based on whatever. But then what we would do is kind of give that group preferential treatment because those are the people that we spend our time with and then kind of look at everybody else who doesn't fit into that group as the out group or the them um, and distinguishing friend from foe. So not necessarily foe because this is not the wild, um, but it makes me think of the, the movie Mean Girls. If you've ever seen that movie where, you know, they're talking about the cafeteria and they're like, this is like the wild jungle, this group and this group and this group and they all sit together. Um, of course, this is a, a non-COVID world where they don't have to sit <laughs> six feet apart. Um, but, you know, think, think about the cafeteria on a normal basis and people sitting in their in-groups, maybe. Um, and you can have various different in-groups, but it's just the idea that, you know, these are people I fit in with and those people I don't. Um, so this idea of in-group versus out-group. One thing that can happen, like I said, is in-group bias. So viewing your in-group in a positive light and maybe applying some negative stereotypes to the out-group. Um, it could be like inferior, calling the out-group inferior, or it could just be like, you know, they are this type of way and applying certain um, behavior traits to them because you are um, 
biased against that group. And this could be conscious or subconscious. All right, so another question to ask ourselves is, does perception change with race? So I want you just to take a look at these pictures here. All right, hopefully you were able to identify uh, these people. But, uh, you know, there was some edits made. So what we want to understand is, you know, does our perception of people change uh, depending on their race? And one thing to be aware of is the other race effect, the other race effect. So this is the tendency to recall faces of one's own race more accurately than the faces of other races. Um, so sometimes this is called the cross race or the own race effect. But this is this is something that they've proven is that we actually will recall faces of one of you, the same race that you identify with um, more accurately than the faces of other races. All right, so prejudice. So studies show that prejudice is often implicit. It's an automatic attitude, knee-jerk reaction, despite what the explicit attitude or behavior says. Um, so how is this learned? This is a question that we're still trying to figure out. Um, and you may have implicit prejudice that you work you know, towards changing, um, but psychologists have been trying to figure this out and look at this uh, you know, is this a behavioral thing? Do we learn this by, you know, looking at modeled behaviors of our parents or those around us? Or are we conditioned to act a certain way, uh, reinforced or punished? You know, is this um, a defense mechanism within the psychoanalytic uh, school of psychology? Or um, is this a cognitive influence? Uh, is this an evolutionary influence? So there's lots of different things that we're trying to study to understand and counteract prejudice. All right, one idea um, that psychologists are finding helps to combat prejudice is contact theory. So contact theory says that contact between hostile groups will reduce animosity if they are made to work towards a superordinate goal. So something that is more important than themselves. So if you've ever seen on like a reality TV show where there's some sort of challenge or task and you know, people who might not like each other are forced to work together to accomplish that challenge or task, and that actually improves their relationship and decreases the hostility between them. That's an example of contact theory. So the more that we can kind of break down those walls and work towards combating that prejudice, um, you know, this could be an example of the mere exposure effect. The more that we're around someone, the more that we like them. Um, and this is one, one way that we can combat prejudice. All right, module 78, shifting gears a little bit, looks at aggression. All right, so aggression is defined as any physical or verbal behavior done with the intention to hurt or destroy another. So the intention to hurt or destroy another whether acting uh, relatively out of hostility or proactively as a calculated means to an end. So self-defense, you know, is an, still an example of aggression, um, you know, because the intention is to defend and to hurt. Uh, or it could be, you know, out of hostility, you are initiating the aggression. Um, research shows that aggressive behavior emerges from the interaction of biology and experience. So we know that there is, you know, some fight or flight response that happens that can trigger aggression, give us uh, additional energy that we need to physically act that out. We know that the amygdala plays a role in the emotion of rage and that when someone is acting aggressively, their frontal lobe may not be engaged as much. They're not thinking things through and planning necessarily um, as clearly as they would when they're not in that fight or flight mode. So. Uh, it could be, you know, the interaction of the experience that, that, that has triggered the aggression or previous experiences and that physiological response. All right, we do have different types of aggression. So we have hostile aggression and we have instrumental aggression. So hostile aggression, the purpose is to harm. Um, and it, like I said, it could be self-defense or it could be the initiation of aggression or violence. Um, 
and instrumental is a purpose to achieve a goal. So whether it be, you know, a certain sport that they're trying to achieve in or whatever the, the constructed uh, goal is that they need to act aggressively in order to achieve. All right, so we do have some sociocultural factors that influence aggression. So looking at aversive stimuli in the environment. So this is what we were talking about a couple weeks ago when I was telling you that the springtime as temperatures warm up is traditionally a season where we see way more violence um, than other seasons. And it could be just with the increased temperature. Um, it also could be things like, you know, the school testing season, um, college, you know, decision season for, for older um, students. Um, people are generally moving more in that season. So there's all these other factors as well, but just looking at environmental factors, uh, what we see is that as temperatures increase, more aggressive behavior is recorded. Um, and so this is a chart you can see as the temperature rises in Houston, Texas, um, we see a correlation. Again, correlation does not imply causation. Someone didn't just go out and murder someone because it was hot outside, um, usually. <laughs> but we do see a correlation between, you know, increased crime and increased temperature. Unfortunately, most recorded school shootings happen in the spring as temperatures increase. Um, and so this is something just to be aware of. We do have these environmental influences on aggression. So we see a correlation of influences on aggression such as hot temperatures, physical pain when someone is, is in pain, they tend to act more aggressively. And I know this is true for me. If I'm, if I'm hurting, I tend to be more short-tempered, um, you know, less likely to have patience uh, versus when I'm not in physical pain. Personal insults tend to trigger aggression foul odors, smoke, and crowding. So again, more reasons why, not just de-individuation um, and group polarization, but more reasons why in that crowd or in that mob, um, we do tend to see the outbreak of aggressive behavior um, more often than we would you know, when you're just alone. All right, the frustration aggression principle um, says that frustration, which is defined as blocking of an attempt to achieve a desired goal, creates anger, which can generate aggression. So this is, I think, almost common sense. Obviously, yes, we do see increased aggressive behaviors when we have increased frustration, but the idea that frustration can generate aggression. Um, so here you have an example, you can read through this. Okay. And then we also do have biological influences on aggression. So one thing to note is that yes, men have more recorded aggressive behavior than women. That doesn't mean that women don't have, you know, aggressive behavior. But what we see is that the hormone testosterone does increase aggressive behavior. And this is kind of funny because I knew when I, I so I have two boys. I knew when I was pregnant that I was pregnant with boys both times. I just had a feeling because I literally felt like punching someone in the face. <laughs> I obviously didn't do it, but I could feel, I just felt this aggressive energy. And, and um, those of you who are male, I don't know if you feel this you know, occasionally or, or all the time, but I definitely felt different when I was pregnant with my boys and there was an increase in testosterone for me. Um, I felt more aggressive. So that's something that was very interesting for me to experience, but we do see, you know, with men, that could be why in general, men are more aggressive than women. And then like we talked about, the amygdala uh, contributing to rage, uh, diminished activity in the frontal lobe, which can lead to more impulsiveness, lack of self-control, other things like drinking alcohol, right? So not only does alcohol impair your hippocampus, um, but it does impair your just frontal lobe functioning in general, which leads you to, you know, more impulsive and uh, 
you know, behaviors that you wouldn't necessarily do usually. So if you see people getting into fights in bars, you know, the influence of alcohol might have increased their likelihood um, to demonstrate aggressive behavior that they wouldn't usually do um, when their frontal lobe was functioning as it should be. Okay, taking a look here at mod 79, this deals with attraction. So this is a really, everybody finds this one interesting. And um, so the first thing of attraction we wanna talk about is physical appearance. So this is people tend to ascribe desirable personality characteristics to good looking people, see them as more sociable, friendly, poised, warm, and well adjusted than ugly people. So uh, this is something that we do know that the more beautiful or physically attractive someone is, the more desirable personality traits we will automatically attribute to them, even without knowing. Um, and in reality, it might not be that way at all. Right, so in reality, research indicates there's little correlation between attractiveness and personality traits. So why do we do this? It could be uh, evolutionary influences. Um, so one of the things that determines our um, attraction to someone is based on this evolutionary idea as to whether or not they would be able to uh, reproduce, right? So for, for men, what they might look for um, consciously or subconsciously, according to the evolutionary perspective, is physical characteristics in a woman that she would be able to bear children. So this is where we get some of the sexualized characteristics that we consider to be quote unquote attractive in our society. For women looking at men, um, and again, you know, obviously this is just for the evolutionary perspective of um, reproduction. So that's why we're focusing on these two. But um, the male attractiveness to a woman is not necessarily the, um, same because it's looking at the man's ability to protect and provide. Um, so women like men with more masculine features and even personality features that show that they're stable enough to protect and provide. Um, so this is kind of interesting to look at with this evolutionary perspective and how that influences who we are attracted to. Other things that influence uh, attractiveness, so sociocultural influences, the mere exposure effect. The more that we are around so someone, the more we like them. So it could be that, you know, the reason why you've become attracted to someone or, you know, you find someone attractive is you know them really well and you continuously have been exposed to them. You've kind of been at the same place, same time, or, you know, you spent some time together and you begin to like them. That would be an example of mere exposure. Uh, and then we do also have cultural ideas as to what's attractive, right? So what's attractive in one culture may be different than what's attractive in another culture. Um, so that's something to keep in mind is the norms of that culture and what they find attractive. All right, so proximity um, is, like I said, geographic nearness. We find that, you know, the more that we're around someone, the more likely it is that we might become attracted to them. Uh, repeated exposure to something breeds liking. All right, one thing to keep in mind within relationships is the idea of reciprocal liking, right? So is it an equitable relationship? Um, so are both people reciprocating? Um, and usually we tend to like someone that likes us. Um, now, not in elementary school where they like continuously tease each other, you know, to show them that they like them, they just torture each other. Um, but as you get older, what you find is that a lot of times you are attracted to someone who is attracted to you. Um, and it could be the reward theory, you know, applying the behavioral ideas to attraction. Um, but it feels good to have someone like you and you then kind of show them that you're feeling good by showing them that you like them. Um, so when we have that equitable uh, reciprocal liking, it tends to contribute to the attraction in a relationship. All right, so according to psychologists, and this is interesting, um, besides proximity and uh, evolutionary characteristics, similarity is actually something that really influences our attraction to someone. And according to psychologists, it's actually that the more similar you are to someone, the more uh, attracted you might be. So it's not opposites attract. Um, now this is interesting because I know many couples who are very different. My husband and I are very different, um, but it could just be, you know, priorities in life are the same. Um, 
And that similarity breeds content. You have the same goals. You have the same moral foundation. And that could be what we mean by similarity versus like, I like, you know, pop music and my husband likes country music. So you could bond over similar things that are, that are like that. But I think what they're looking at is like similarity in maybe socioeconomic status or priorities or other um, social cultural influences. So you can make up your own mind about that. All right, and then again, classical conditioning, conditioning can play a part in attraction. Um, you know, if you like chicken wings and you see the waitress every time she brings chicken wings, you can actually condition yourself to like the waitress because you associate her with the chicken wings. I know this is a silly example, but it is possible that you could be, um, that behaviorism could be influencing attraction. All right, how romantic love changes over time. We do know that there's two different types of love, passionate love versus companionate love. Passionate love is kind of this honeymoon stage, stage the arousal stage, very intense uh, absorption in another. You always wanna be around each other. You might have like, um, you know, a, a very physical relationship for some people. Um, and this is the beginning of relationship. As relationships evolve, um, usually what happens is companionate love grows. This is the deep love, the friendship, um, you know, just feeling very connected to someone, not even necessarily physically, um, but just that deep connection. And so um, sometimes relationships don't survive because they have that passionate love, but they don't develop that companionate love. And what we find is that the relationships that are most successful continue to maintain both of these um, as they uh, stay together. All right, so this just shows you that. Okay, and then the last module of the year, oh my goodness, um, altruism, conflict, and peacemaking. So altruism is acting unselfishly, unselfish regard for the welfare of others. Does it actually exist? <laughs> That's the question. So when someone does something unselfish, you have to kind of question their motive, right? Especially in the world we live in today. It could be that they're actually doing it to relieve their own stress, uh, guilt, or discomfort. Maybe they're having some cognitive dissonance they're trying to resolve um, or to provide euphoric feelings of pride and self-worth or to get some sort of recognition. If that's the case, then it's not really altruism because altruism is supposed to be truly unselfish. Um, one thing we know is that when we look at bystander intervention, um, we can determine factors that might influence whether someone will act altruistically and help or not. So one thing we know is the bystander, bystander effect. All right, so um, the case that made this very, very famous is the Kitty Genovese murder in Queens, New York in 1964. And what we find with the bystander effect is that when you are a bystander, you're, you are standing around or you witness something bad happen to someone, there are conditions that might make it more or less likely that you will help them, all right? And so in general, the more people that are around, the more bystanders, the less likely you are to help. And it seems crazy because you would think, okay, well, there's all these people like this person's gonna get help. But what happens is there's a diffusion of responsibility. So the reason why you won't help is because you think, well, there's all these people here, somebody else is gonna do it. Somebody else is gonna do something. And so this diffusion of responsibility that everyone's feeling actually makes it less likely that the person will be helped. Versus when there's less bystanders around, like if you're the only one you know, on a car accident scene, you know that you have to be the one to call 911. You have to be the one, you know, to kind of like make sure that everything's taken care of because there's nobody else around to do it. Um, so this is something to keep in mind. All right. So the bystander effect, the tendency of any given bystander to be less likely to give aid if other bystanders are present. All right. So someone uh, has the best odds for helping when the person appears to need help or you feel they deserve help, that's a, that's a loaded uh, thing for us to think about. If the person is similar to us in some way, we're more likely to help them. Believe it or not, if the person is a woman, we're more likely to help them. Uh, and this is, again, cultural influences. Uh, if we just observe someone being helpful, we're more likely to help. I always think of my 
um, kids kindergarten class, you know, when you see one person do something and then they, they're like, oh, thank you, that was so helpful. Then somebody else is like very quick to do something helpful for someone to try to do the same thing. If we're not in a hurry, um, so don't confuse this with, you know, being unemployed because they don't have a job. This just literally means we are not in a rush to get somewhere. Uh, if you're in a small town or a rural area, you're more likely to be helped. If you feel guilty, you're more likely to help someone. And if you're in a good mood, you're more likely to help someone. So this is interesting. Other things that influence altruism and helping others, the reciprocity norm. So reciprocity being reciprocal, right? You will help those that have helped you, right? Oh, I owe you. You've helped me before. We have that type of reciprocity in our relationship. I, I, I'm going to help you. And then the social responsibility norm, helping people that need your help. So if you see them as someone who needs help, whether it be a lower socioeconomic status than you, they're smaller in stature than you, or they're less fortunate than you, or something that you know, you know, that you have a social responsibility, um, then you're more likely, to, you're older than them, you're more likely to help them. All right, um, so then we look at conflict, um, a perceived incompatibility of actions, goals, or ideas. All right, so how can we promote peacemaking and uh, solve conflict? Well, we know having a superordinate goal, something that you're working to, towards together that's bigger than yourselves, um, and that contact theory, also, fostering cooperation, communication, and conciliation are ways to work through conflict. All right, social traps are when conflicting parties pursue their own self-interest rather than the good of the group. All right, so it's almost like a tragedy of the commons type idea, if you have uh, heard of that. So I'm, you know, I want to take a shower. I'm going to use all the hot water. I don't care that other people in the house need hot water because... I've had my shower and that's all that I care about. So that's an example of a social trap. But if everybody does that, you know, there's no, there's no water for anybody. Um, overfishing, right? Or overuse of resources, it's tragedy of the commons where if everybody takes more than, you know, they're supposed to, eventually there'll be nothing left for anyone. So this is an example where, you know, sometimes we do need to work together. Self-fulfilling prophecy we've been talking about all year long, belief that leads to its own fulfillment. All right, and then the last just kind of random thing that talks uh, that is talked about in Mod 80 is grit. So I wanted to make this, dis this um, distinction, especially for those of you that are taking U.S. history this year or have taken U.S. history. All right, so um, grit with uh, just lowercase, like capital G maybe, but lowercase letters is what we're talking about in social psych, um, passion and perseverance towards goals and resiliency. Like, man, she's got a lot of grit. Um, versus GRIT, graduated and reciprocated initiatives and tension reduction. You may have heard this term when you were discussing the Cold War, for example, looking at detente and easing tensions in the Cold War or, um, you know, mutual treaties of uh, nuclear disarmament, disarmament, that is an example of grit with uh, capital letters. So just make sure that you understand the difference between these two. When we're looking at psychology, usually we're looking at uh, resiliency and the ability to work towards and persevere towards your goals. All right, so that is the end of uh, all of your mods, and we're going to go ahead and start the review process after this. Congratulations.